Good morning. Um, sorry, we're starting a little late. Uh, shall we just begin with a word of prayer? Would anyone be willing to pray for us? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day, this time. Thank you this morning, Holy Spirit. Father, Lord, you guide us, lead us. I send each everyone, Lord, give you wisdom and knowledge. We will be able to understand your word of God. Lord, you talk with us through your word of God. You show the man, Lord, I submit your hands, give you knowledge and wisdom. You will be able to teach us. So I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so just um, to talk a little bit about our schedule, I think uh, we'll be done on April 22nd, uh, which will be the last week of your classes on Monday. Um, so I'll post the exam on that day and give you all until Saturday to finish. Is that OK? OK, so. Uh, April 22nd, and then you'll have till, I think, the end of the week, um, which is 27th, April 27th. So you'll have about five days to uh, finish your exam, OK? Uh, so today we're going to look at, um, I thought we'll do the book of James and Jude, so that uh, next week we can do first and second Peter on Monday, and then first, second, third John on Thursday. Uh, so today we'll do James and Jude, and um, also for Thursday's class next week for second, third John, um, we'll do that more as a discussion. I won't teach those three books. Uh, so what I'm going to ask you to do is to read all three books. Okay, first, second, third John. Um, I'll I'll cover the background or all of that. If you want to read that from the textbook, then great. You can read that as well. Uh, but to at least write, read those three letters and come prepared to just do a, we'll do a discussion in class on those three letters, OK? So that will be next Thursday for second and third John. OK, uh, let's begin with the book of James. Just. Sorry, I think the connection just dropped, the internet connection. Um, yeah, we're back. OK, so let's. Uh, begin with the book of James. So um, an introduction to the book. Uh, the book 
basically is very practical so it's talking uh, very much about how do we live our faith practically um, and i'm sure you've heard many many sermons preached on the book of james so you're familiar with uh, the content of it but um, as, as, as we look through the book that is something to keep in mind uh, the author for the book uh, as per tradition, is James the brother of Jesus? And um, why we can also come to that conclusion is because he doesn't give any description about who he is. If you remember in, um, in the Gospels, when Jesus chooses his disciples, there's a James there, right? And usually when there's a common name like that, there will be an addition to the name to distinguish them from other James. Uh, so we see, uh, let me just uh, see. So there's James the Lesser, who's the, uh, who's the Apostle James. OK, so uh, here he's not given that kind of description, which means that he was someone who was so prominent, he didn't have to say who he was. Uh, so that's why it's believed that this is uh, Jesus's brother, James. So what do we know about him from scripture? Uh, we know from John 7 that uh, Jesus's brothers didn't believe him at first. Let's just read that John 7 verses 3 to 5. Someone can read that for us. John 7, verse 3, his brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret, while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for even his brothers did not believe in him. OK, so we know that uh, Jesus' brothers didn't believe in him while he was uh, ministering on earth. Uh, but if we read from Acts 1.14 about uh, all the believers who had gathered to pray during uh, before the Pentecost, they gathered to pray in the upper room. It's mentioned that Mary and Jesus' brothers were also part of that group. Uh, so. It was only post Jesus' resurrection that his brothers came to faith in him. And so James uh, also, like the rest of the brothers, came to faith during this time. Um, we'll just read 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8. Uh, if someone can read that for us, it'll just show us where it is and how it is that uh, James actually came to faith. First uh, Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 to 8. For I deliver to you as of first importance. What I also received, that Christ died for our, our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Gephas, then the twelve, then, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one ultimately born, he appeared also to me. OK, so we see here the account of how James came to faith in Jesus. It was because the resurrected Christ appeared to him. Uh, and then uh, we don't know about the other brothers, but probably through James, the rest of the brothers also came to faith. Um, sorry, this is OK. Um, so 
Apart from this, we know that after he came to faith, he began to lead the church in Jerusalem. And we see that in various places where Paul is recording his travels. And he says every time he went back to Jerusalem, he reported to James and the elders of the church. Uh, so uh, James was one of the main leaders in the church. We'll just read one of those accounts from Acts 15. 13 to 21. If someone can read that for us. Acts 15 verses 13 to 21. Can I read, sister? Yes, please. Go ahead, sister. Acts 15, 13 to 21. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of the mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things, known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, immorality, from things strangled and from blood. For Moses had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogue every Sabbath. Thank you. So this is an example of the meetings that were being held uh, where James was presiding as the overseer of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, and so uh, this is where Paul and Barnabas go back to find out, should the Gentiles be circumcised? And uh, James gives this judgment uh, on behalf of all of the elders in the church. Uh, so James was also known as the camel need because he was known for uh, praying on his knees. Uh, so this is more from outside of scripture. We were looking at what we know about James from scripture itself. Uh, but outside of scripture, he was someone who was known for praying on his knees. And so his knees had become uh, tough like a camel's knees. He's also known as James the Just. Uh, so we read from outside Jewish writers that he was highly esteemed by people in Jerusalem, um, especially by the poor. And you'll see that as you read the book, uh, that James is very focused on the poor versus the rich, how the rich are exploiting the poor. Uh, and so this is something that was part of his life, that he cared about the poor in the city. He was admired for his devotion to God. And he spoke against the rich very uh, openly. This is why a lot of the priests who were in power, who were uh, in places of authority and in the higher classes, opposed him. And he was put to death uh, by the high priest uh, Ananus II in 62 AD. Uh, but after he was put to death, because the people uh, were so, um, he was so highly esteemed by people, uh, they actually made a big noise about him being put to death, and the high priest was removed uh, from his position as high priest. So uh, this letter we know from uh, chapter 1, verse 1, is written to Jewish Christians scattered among the nations. If we read Acts 8, we know that persecution started in Jerusalem and the believers uh, moved to other parts of the Roman Empire because of the persecution. Uh, so it's possible that he's writing to all of these Christians who have uh, moved away because of the persecution. 
So uh, a little bit of the background to the book. Um, there was a lot of uh, the Roman Empire was uh, mistreating Jewish, uh, the Jews uh, in many ways. They had taken a lot of their land. And so a lot of the farmers had uh, had been had lost their land basically they didn't have a land to grow crops on they didn't have a way to earn a living so they ended up working for the rich working on their lands as daily laborers uh, which meant that they didn't have a um, sustainable way of living they didn't know if they would have work every day uh, they could only work in certain seasons when it was a harvest season, they would have work and they could earn money. So they were suffering financially and also they were paying high taxes. Uh, so this led to a lot of uh, animosity between the rich. And, and who felt that Jews should not side with the Romans. And so uh, there was this uh, kind of uh, animosity between the priests and the zealots. Uh, this finally ended up in the revolt, which was uh, led by the Jews in AD 66 and led to the destruction of the temple in AD 70. So this was the situation uh, that um, James was writing in that there was this kind of tension between the rich and the poor, between the rulers and the lower class. And uh, he addresses a lot of that. He writes a lot against the rich and against the exploitation of poor in this book. Uh, it's the book was definitely written before AD 62 because that's when um, James is believed to have been put to death. Um, so possibly even as early as 41 to 50 AD and most probably in Jerusalem because as far as we know James was in Jerusalem uh, post his coming to faith he served in Jerusalem itself. Uh, so we'll read two of the key verses from James uh, chapter 1 verse 15 and 226. Someone can read those verses for us. James 1. 15. Then when Dijas has
Um, so I'm sorry, I think uh, there's some problem with the internet connection to my laptop. Um, could you, uh, for those online, um, could you all just tell me, I, I'm not sure when the call exactly dropped off. Um, but maybe we'll just continue from where we stopped. Uh, if you all miss something, we'll have it recorded on the video. Or oh, actually, it won't be recorded on the video as well. Uh, yeah, if you can just tell me where we where uh, I got disconnected for those online. From the keywords, ma'am. At the keywords, is it? Yeah, keywords. Is OK, OK, thank you. Um, let me just check how much we covered since then. OK, uh, so we'll just continue. OK, uh, we looked a little bit at the differences between Paul and James writing. Uh, all of this is in your textbook, so you um, can go back and read this. Uh, but basically, to say that Paul emphasizes works, uh, uh, Paul says uh, there's justification by faith, not by works. That is, we are saved by faith uh, and not by works. And James talks more about works as an outcome of our faith. Uh, so that's the difference in their writing. There isn't any contradiction. Rather, they're talking about works differently. Uh, the kind of works they're talking about is different. And the um, the purpose of the works. So the works are not to save us. Rather, the works are to uh, serve as a witness to the people around us uh, of our salvation. OK? Uh, so we looked also at some unique features. And uh, we were reading through uh, some of the passages here that James uses to uh, kind of talk about different topics. Uh, he's using examples from nature to talk about these topics. So we were reading, we read the first one uh, from chapter 1, verses 10 to 11. So maybe we'll read that one again, and then we'll continue from there. Chapter 1, verses 10 to 11. James chapter 1, verse 10 to 11. But the rich in his humiliation, because he has the flower of the field, he will pass away. Verse 11. For no sonar has the sun rays with a burning heat then it then it witherness the grass its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes so the rich man also will fade away in his purity thank you and uh, james chapter 3 verses 3 to 8 james chapter 3 verses 3 to 8 Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at sheep, all, although they are so large and are driven by first winds, they are turned by a sm very small ruder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defies the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Okay, thank you. I think we're running out of time, so we won't read the rest of the verses. Uh, but these are just examples of how James uses uh, nature to describe uh, the things that he's talking about, um, the other references as well. Uh, one talks about the salt water and spring water that is in verses 11 to 12. And chapter 4, verse 14, um, talks about um, 
yeah, like the fog in the morning, which appears in the morning and is gone uh, by midday. So um, it's just beautiful imagery to describe certain things that he's talking about. Uh, with that, we'll just come to the outline um, and uh, do a quick overview of what James talks about. Uh, James begins with talking about people who are being tested. Um, so in uh, we understood that there was a lot of oppression happening for the Jews under the Roman rule. And so we can understand why James is addressing uh, testing right at the start. And he's encouraging them that through these times of testing, you grow in your faith, you grow in perseverance and in endurance. Uh, he then goes into hearing and obeying the word, uh, encouraging people not only to read the word, but to do what they are reading, to live out what they are, uh, what they are reading in the word of God. Um, from chapter 2 onwards, he is where we go into that section where he's addressing different topics. The first is addressing partiality. So don't show partiality to the rich while uh, disregarding the poor is the first section. Uh, the next is encouraging people to live out their faith through their works. He uses the example of Abraham and Rahab. Abraham, he says, uh, we know that he was someone who believed because he actually went to the point of sacrificing Isaac. His faith was uh, evidenced by that act. And then he uses Rahab as an example of how she protects the spies. Uh, so both of them, they were not people who just had faith with no evidence of their faith, but they were people who showed their faith through their works. Um, 3, 1 to 12 is that passage we just read uh, on controlling the tongue. Um, 3, 13 to 18 talks about worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. Um, chapter 4, he talks about worldliness uh, against love of the world, against slandering one another, against planning our future without uh, completely depending on God before we make plans for the future. Uh, and then chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, uh, he warns against the dangers of wealth. Uh, that's actually a really good passage. Um, but I'm not sure that we have time to read it. Uh, and then chapter 5, he goes on to talk about patience uh, because of the suffering that they are experiencing. He's encouraging them to be patient in the face of their suffering. Uh, then he talks about praying for the sick and uses the example of Elijah praying for rain. Uh, and then closes with um, reclaiming those who have turned away from the faith. So bringing back those who have fallen away, restoring them uh, to the faith. And with that, we come to the end of the book of James. Um, we'll quickly go through the book of Jude as well. Um, this is actually, these are two books that go well together because they're both written by brothers of Jesus. So Jude was also a brother of Jesus. Um, and he, in this book, is addressing false teachers um, because a lot of false teaching had come into the church. And the church was slowly adopting some of that false teaching. They were starting to be influenced by that teaching. So Jude is writing to warn against it. Uh, and so, uh, part of that was sexual immorality. Uh, so it's the same uh, like we read about James, that he didn't believe in Jesus during his ministry, but only post-resurrection he started to believe in Jesus. Uh, the recipients for the letter are Christians everywhere. So he writes to all Christians. There's no specific audience that he's writing to. Um, a few things about the date of writing. Uh, probably around AD 69. Uh, he doesn't mention anything about the fall of Jerusalem. So uh, that's why we think it's before AD 70. Uh, in one chapter 1, verse 17, he talks about what the apostles had taught the church. So suggests that a lot of the apostles were already had already died, uh, but these churches had been led by the apostles themselves. 
some of the unique features okay it's addressed to christians everywhere not not written to a specific church um it emphasizes the relationship between right believing right living talks about opposition to god from before time to the end of time uh, there are some ot illustrations so some illustrations from the old testament uh, and this is the only book where we have the record of that dispute over moses's body so let's just turn to that uh, chapter um, jude uh, which only has one chapter verse 9 if we can read that It's so, Michael the Archangel. Sister, you can go. Yeah. It's Michael the Archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, "The Lord rebuke you." Thank you. So uh, here Jude is talking about the false teachers. He's talking about how arrogant they are in the way they are so quick to slander people. They uh, don't think about the words that are coming out, out of their mouth. And he uses this example. So it's the only place in scripture that talks about this dispute over Moses's body. Uh, and then in chapter 1, verses 14 to 15, he refers to the book of Enoch which we don't have in our Bible, but was part of the Jewish uh, literature outside. So it's, uh, it's part of the, um, the Apocrypha. So there's extra books in the Old Testament that we don't have included in our Bibles. Um, comparison with other books, like the book of James, he also uses nature. Uh, to describe certain things. And uh, he talks about false teachers that Peter prophesies about. So we haven't yet covered the second, uh, the book of uh, Second Peter, the letter of Second Peter. But uh, they both talk about false teachers. And so Jude seems to be referring to the same kind of false teaching. Now uh, we'll read a few verses from this book. Um, since it's such a short book, just reading a few verses will give us an idea of what the book talks about. Uh, but uh, before we do that, we'll just look a little bit at what, uh, the, what the book overall talks about. So chapter 1, verse 1, uh, he begins with a warning against false uh, teaching. The first, uh, first verse is just a greeting. Uh, but what uh, is very interesting here in that first verse um, is that he says, uh, to all who have been called by God, who loves you and keeps you uh, in the care of Jesus Christ, or you have been kept for Jesus Christ. So right in the start there, he's saying that you are being guarded for Christ's return. And uh, so when he's addressing this false teaching, he's saying, um, even in the face of false teaching, you are going to be kept safe. Um, he then goes on to warn against false teachers who have come in. If someone can just read for us verse 4, um, that gives us an idea about who these false teachers are. Sure. For certain uh, men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord Jesus and our Lord Jesus Christ. OK, so uh, these uh, false teachers had come in, and um, they were teaching that you can live a life that is immoral. Um, and uh, Jude is saying, by this teaching, they are denying Jesus himself. Uh, so he's warning against their teaching. Uh, it goes on to pass judgment. Uh, so talking about God's judgment of these um, of people in the past who have turned away who, who have taught uh, people and led them astray. Um, and then verses 8 to 16 um, talks about uh, 
uh, a little more about false teachers and what is their destiny, the future destiny of uh, teachers who will lead people astray. Uh, we'll just read from verses 20 to 24, if uh, you can just read that for us, verses 20 to 24. You can go ahead and read. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, 20 to 24. Verse. But you will up building yourself up on, the, on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and on some have compassion, making a distinction. But others see with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with excess, exceeding joy. You did all the way to 24? OK. Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear very well. So uh, so what is uh, really important about this book is that Jude describes all of these apostasies, all of this wrong teaching, what has been said about them, how the apostles warned against them. And then he concludes with, how do you stay firm in your faith in the face of all this false teaching? Uh, so that is the key. Although false teaching may exist and um, it's going to come against the church, how do we as believers continue to stay strong in our faith uh, so that we are, like he says right in the beginning, we are kept for Jesus Christ. So we are guarded until Christ's return. Um, and what are some of those key points that he mentions in that verse? What are some ways that we can stay strong? Keep yourself in the love of God. What are some Only other things? Our Lord Jesus uh, is able to keep us from stumbling. Jesus is able to keep us from stumbling, yes. Yeah. Thank you. What's that? Sorry. Be compassionate. Be compassionate. Yeah. So even if there are people who uh, come to a place of doubting, to have mercy towards them, to be compassionate towards them. Building ourselves up in our faith. So continuing to grow in faith. And uh, he's saying this almost as building each other up, right, in the church, uh, building each other up in our faith as well. Praying in the spirit, right? Anything else? Save others. So save people who are falling away from the faith. Uh, so this is very important. It's not only us keeping ourselves strong, but also caring for our brothers and sisters in the church who are falling away from the faith, building them up, uh, making sure that they don't fall away from the faith. Uh, so we will close with that. Uh, but just. A reminder of this is what um, Jude talks about, right? Jude is talking about false teachers, but uh, encouraging us that in the midst of that kind of false teaching, we can stay strong. We don't have to fall away uh, when false teaching comes into the church. And he gives us some key ways for which we can stay strong in the faith. Um, we'll close here and I'll see you all on Monday. We'll do first and second Peter when we, um,
when we meet on Monday. Thank you.